Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 10, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, and I appreciate you showing up. I'm humbled by your presence, so thank you for being here. All right, what we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and we've got a lot to talk about there. I'm actually going to have some charts in my chart show. I know, what a concept. Your questions on trading, uh, if you don't mind while we're on the slides, keep them to what's on the slides, but then you could ask about whatever you want. I could always uh, jump back to a blank screen or come back to the slides as necessary. And the same thing goes for stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks until we actually get to the charts. That way it won't get buried in other questions. And also, and when you ask about a stock, ask about one stock at a time and that's for your benefit so I can make sure I see the stock and I don't always know the symbols so uh, be sure to actually put the symbol in so I can uh, get to it more quickly and what else has happened I think that's pretty much it uh, this week's focus winter is coming how to survive and prosper during the upcoming bear market I know you've probably addressed this in the past, but how come with repeating webinars I have to sign up every week? You shouldn't have to. I'm not sure why that is, but um, we'll look into that after the show. That was a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. So winter is coming. Now, the first question you're asking is, well, how do you know? Well, I don't know. But I do know this. I know that markets go up, and I know that markets go down. Now, as I often preach, that's a bit of a Captain Obvious statement, but you'd be surprised at how many people fight trends. And unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. So what I'm teaching you today is to just pay attention and know that markets don't always go up. And here are some signs and signals and things to look out for. And then action, if any, that should be taken based on them. So it's better to be safe than sorry. Now, there's been quite a few non-quantifiable observations as of late. Now, by non-quantifiable, it's just signs and signals and not, not so much signals, but just some things that have been happening that have me a little concerned, but they're not quantifiable. You can't trade off of them. And lately we've been having this frenzy over Dow 22,000. And, of course, I did see a stupid Dow 22,000 hat on the news. If anybody remember when Dow 10,000 hats came out? That was so stupid. Anyway. Kind of a uh, nail in the coffin there. But the media is going apeshit over this Dow 22,000. And what I would encourage you to do after this presentation, of course, is to watch last week's presentation where I talked about what Dow 22,000 means. Now, there's been some complacency and some buy and hold arguments, and some of that kind of dovetails in with the Dow 22,000. I don't watch a whole lot of news, but sometimes I'll put it on while I'm on the spin bike or whatever. And I did notice that they were talking about an excitement of the Dow 22,000, how low the Dow was back in 2009 and how quickly it came back. And they were implying buy and hold, which is usually a bad deal. I like our cash and he keeps the hats and wears them up and down. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing I'm not a huge fan of is the fact that the administration is claiming the rally. I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. To do. Um, I remember when interest rates were peaking out many years ago, and I think it was, uh, I think it's when Bush won, lost, and somebody asked me right before the election, "What do you think about?" The presidency, who would be better for the market? I said, I don't really know. 
But I do know this, whoever wins is going to look like a freaking genius because rates were at 8 9% back then. I think the 30-year bond was at 8% or something. And the Fed has started cutting rates. Now, some of you people may be old enough to realize or remember, I should say, how important that was when the Fed would cut rates. They did. There wasn't always this helicopter bin thing in our mentality, I should say, out there. So I think it's a bad idea. I think that's a bit of a maybe a jinx to claim the rally. You know, if you're going to claim it, maybe claim it four years from now, you know. Now, those aren't quantifiable, but it is some interesting observations. Now, there are a few signs and potential signals out there, at least one signal. One thing that has me concerned as of late is the amount of debacle du jour. Now, by debacle du jour, I mean every day we're having some stocks get torpedoed. And here are just a couple of recent examples and there's a plethora of, of them out there. There's Tef, Tesla, as you can see. I'm sorry, not Tesla. Teva, Pharmaceuticals. Vico has been torpedoed as of late. BNFT. That's a little bit more obscure, but Office Depot, I think it was, got hit yesterday. In fact, I know it got hit yesterday. Trivago recently hit fairly hard in here. And those are just a few of the debacle du jour. There's quite a few other ones. And one thing that I do every day as I preach is I look at my tradable universe, which is all stocks sorted by historical volatility. And also, I'm sorry, all stocks with an average volume greater than 250,000 shares, 30-day average volume. So they're they're not... Super liquid, but they're liquid enough to trade, and they're still fairly small cap issues at, at the bottom end of that scale. And then I sort them by historical volatility, and I go through the majority of those. There's about 3,000 in my list now. As I get to the lower volatility stocks, I tend to skim over them, or I'll quit maybe when I get down to the HV of 20, 25, somewhere in there. Knowing that I'm going to run a scan anyway on these, and it's going to probably pick up anything that would be of interest that has an HV that low. But in doing this process, you you not only see the stocks that are currently set up, but you get a feel for what's going on. And you'll notice, are the majority of stocks headed lower? Are the majority of stocks headed higher? Or there are stocks that are just headed side, or or the majority of stocks just headed sideways? And one of the important things that I learned very early on is the amount of debacle du jour. So if you're starting to see more and more and more and more stocks get hit, then that could be a little bit of concern. Now, I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but there have been some stocks that have been taken off as of late to kind of balance that out a little bit. So that's certainly a good thing. Somebody was asking me to compare the debacle du jour now compared to 2008. Well, in 2008, late 2007, early 2008, or in fact, I would say uh, October, November of 2007, it was more of the amount of stocks that were in sell signals, the amount of stocks that were forming bow ties and first thrusts and everything. I couldn't find a long to save my life. The good news right now is I still have a fairly substantial momentum list of stocks that I'm watching for potential setups. But getting back to the amount of debacle du jour, yes, it is concerning. And the problem with that is when you have a stock that gets torpedoed, something like the Teva, for instance, it really weighs on the subsector. And not only does it weigh on a subsector, but it also casts a pall, so to speak, upon other stocks in the sector. And remember, Markets move based on the psychology of their participants. So if the psychology changes to where it turns negative, 
then people may sell stocks. People may sell, quote unquote, good stocks. And I'll come back to that when we talk about the new highs. And when that subsector begins to drop, it begins to weigh on the sectors. And I'm going to walk you through this in just a few minutes when we get to the live charts. And then obviously, as the sectors begin to head lower, it begins to weigh on the indices. So I don't think the debacle du jour or something that should be taken lightly. Now, you can't go out and say, well, we've got 20 total, so now it's time to short. But it is part of the puzzle, and that's what I'll often preach. There's no switch that gets flipped. You'll notice a lot of times I'll put the little life switch graphic with bull bear on it. It's not always a f switch that gets flipped, or it's rarely a flip that gets switched to where you know, aha, now we're in a bull bear phase or a bull phase. But more of a puzzle and the pieces of the puzzle begin coming together. So let's talk about some of these things in addition to debacle du jour. Now, the rusty remains the rub. Now, the reason I say rusty now, I don't know if you saw that slide a second ago, because we do. I do want to show you a weekly signal that we had a couple years ago in the rusty. Now, I'm going to walk you through bow ties in just one second, but a bow tie is basically... For those of you who aren't familiar with the pattern, we're just looking for, I don't know why my pin's not working. Let me change pins. We're looking for the moving averages to come together and then spread out over a fairly short period of time. And that action forms a fulcrum. Let's see if this will work, maybe. What I call a fulcrum, and this this will make more sense in just one second. Talk amongst yourselves while I futz with my pen. Technology is great when it works. All right, let's try one more time. All right. So you want to see them come together over a short period of time. This action suggests that the, the tide may be turning. And the reason is you have... I'm going to be lost without my pen. You have shorter term and longer term cycles coming together. The natives are getting restless. Now, when that happens over a short period of time, it suggests that the trend may be turning. It's not, it doesn't mean that it's the end of the world. And if you notice in the Russell, what you have is, I don't know why it won't work, but you don't have the little bump, the little rally in here to complete the bow tie pattern. And I'll walk you through that in just one second. Let me start this uh, slideshow over today. For some reason, we're having some technical difficulties in here there we go all right thought i'd be lost without it yeah let me just go back and show you that russell now we're going to talk about the russell in detail when we get to the actual charts but the point i was making is the moving averages come together over a short period of time and then they begin to spread out again. And like right here, you can see they were kind of sloppy. I mean, it was a bit of a signal, but they all came, it all turned back up again. And the market got a little choppy. Now it's a little bit concerning because you can see the, the Russell just made new highs right back here. And now it's been in a bit of a slide. Now, the other thing I've been noticing quite a bit lately is the number of shorts that are showing up in my Landry list. As I often say, yeah, it's the third bow tie in three months, but they've been a little sloppy in the moving averages. And we'll take a look at that when we get to the live charts. But there's been quite a few, few longs and quite a few shorts setting up. As I often preach, the shorts I have checked in here. 
you want to listen to your database and see what it's telling you. Now, I'm not putting on any shorts just yet, but I am paying attention to the number of shorts that are happening in the database. So what action should we take? Well, first of all, you have to remember if you're a true trend follower and you truly believe in trend following. And by the way, the only way to ever make any money in the market is to capture a trend. But if you're a true trend follower, you will overstay your welcome. Okay? As I often preach, all trades will eventually end badly. Even if you're in a fantastic trade, eventually you'll get stopped out. But the reason you don't exit at the first signs of adversity because is because if you did, you would never catch a trend. But yes, one day it will be a bona fide reversal. And that's why we just trail a stop higher. We can take it out. We can take it out. We don't look at this little last part in the end, as I often preach and as I talked about a lot in the trading full circle course, and get depressed. We look at from where we got in to where we got out, and we feel good about that. Okay? That's how the game is played. But yes. You will be a little late. That's why they call it trend following, okay? And it kind of reminds me. I don't want to digress too far. But you know me, though. Anybody remember Prodigy? I, I've never told the story before, but I remember when I was first getting started in trading, or well, very early in my trading career, and there was this thing called Prodigy, and they had these stock boards, and I'd get on there, and I became friendly with a guy, and we actually would talk on the phone. He was a little older than me. And he was pumping this pump. It was a it was a surgical pump or whatever, some sort of medical pump or whatever. And he kept pumping it every day. And I would, like an idiot, I was putting all the money I had into this stupid little stock or a significant portion, I should say, of my portfolio. And he just kept pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping. And one day they came out with bad earnings and the stock got like halved overnight. And so I called him up and, you know, a little bit of a WTF. <laughs> and he's, I'll never forget what he said. David, no one rings a bell when a stock tops. <laughs> it's like, you know, that was a very expensive lesson for me on a variety of levels. But, you know, he's right. You know, I wish he'd have told me that when he was pumping it, though. But no one rings a bell when a stock tops. And as a trend follower, you will overstay your welcome. We don't get paid to be right. You don't get paid to pick that exact top. You might get one in your career, and I guess a couple of careers have been launched off of that, so maybe that's <laughs> the excitement of trying to do that. But you're better off just being, as they call me, a trend-following moron and not try to outsmart the market and just follow along. So leave the top picking to the gurus. And I was part of the hedge fund years ago, and I the the, the – the, Owner of the hedge fund often said, predict early and often when referring to the gurus. And I, there's a fairly recent example of this. We had the, the NASDAQ. There was a guru out there calling a the top every freaking day. Well, we had one little sell-off, and then he's like, you see, I told you. It's like, well, you've been calling a top for six months. And there's been a substantial rally ever since. So you've been wrong for a long, long time. Just don't get caught up in that, okay? And you're not going to look smart in this business, and you're not going to look smart as a trend follower. But if you follow the process longer term, you're going to do just fine. So what's the action? Well, first thing, you want to see each position to its fruition. So don't rush out and sell everything. You might need that, okay? You might need that one outlier. That one outlier might just make your year. It's been a tough year so far for, for me because the, the, it's not, the individual issues haven't been performing as well as the overall indices would suggest. 
And as I often preach, one or two outliers can make you a year. And so far, I hate to put all my eggs in this one basket, but so far, well, I have it because it's money management. But, but so far, this stock has been our biggest winner of the year, and it's done fairly well. And if we'd have bailed out every time the market looked a little questionable, or every time this stock looked a little questionable, we would have micromanaged ourselves out of this position. So I would encourage you to stay the course. And yes, this stock will, will stop us out. And I hate to use the word hold, but hopefully it will be at maybe a 300% gain, but maybe it was up 350% before it's 300, okay? The point I'm making there is if you quit at 50%, you'll never make 100. You quit at 100%, you never make 200%. And if you quit at 200%, you never make 400% and so on and so forth. Now, we've got a couple of stinkers in the portfolio, but who knows? And actually, one's getting hit harder today, which makes for not a great example. But it could come back. You know, who knows? But this C and DT actually came back nicely yesterday, and it looked a little dubious the day before. It looked like it was getting ready to break down. So just follow the plan. Your stop is going to take you out if you are wrong. A properly placed stop, that is. A stop that will suggest your position is wrong, in other words, the trend has turned, will take you out. Now, you can't go in and use a really tight stop because that's going to guarantee you a loss. So see each position to its fruition. Now, you want to be super duper selective on new positions. And along those lines, also consider stocks that are a little bit more speculative, inefficient, because a lot of times, something like an IPO, a very newer IPO, won't be held hostage as much to the market's move. You still can have positive movements. Now, the old adage, a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, a sinking tide, in other words, if the overall market starts going down, will drag down all stocks eventually, for the most part. And that's the danger of playing the relative strength game. You know, there's always a bull market as bullshit because you go back to 2009 and there it's like everything got hit, okay? They threw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. And I think I talked about that in layman's doing some relative strength analysis. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of relative strength analysis, but that can get you into a lot of trouble, especially once you're in a bona fide bear market. Now, right now, when things are a little iffy, a little sideways, a little choppy, rusty, not looking so good, indices haven't hit new highs in a while, net-net change hasn't changed too much lately, and we'll look at that in just one second. Sometimes these more speculative issues can move contra or in lieu of the overall market because they're inefficient. The large price moves, the large potential price moves aren't priced in. So read the article on inefficiency or the special report under special reports on my website. You have to walk through the gift shop to get there. In other words, you have to go to the store, but it's at the bottom of the list. Commodities might be worth a shot, but only if they're trending. OK. And some of the commodities have actually gotten hit yes, late, lately, like CENX, which is a now aluminum company, actually got nailed recently. And melted down. But aluminum looks OK right now overall. You don't want to buy commodities for the sake of buying them. Silver's banging out new lows in spite of all the stupid commercials on TV. <laughs> If silver just returns a half of its all-time highs, yeah, well, if my aunt had, you know, she'd be my uncle. Um, I guess nowadays, you know, what's, what's going to happen nowadays with all these genders? Will we still have aunts and uncles? I don't want to digress too far. But, yeah, buy commodities, but only if they're set up. And the great thing is, like, sometimes in a, in a abysmal bear market, you'll have gold begin to set up because people are looking for a little flight to safety. So that's why we're looking at an IPO right now in the open portfolio as a potential setup. And we only have one potential setup. And if you've been following along with the service over the last several weeks, you'll notice that I didn't recommend anything. 
It's like, why would you pay a guy to tell you not to do anything? Well, boy, I tell you, I wish I'd have had someone 20 something years ago telling me not to do anything quite often when the market's choppy or headed lower and I'm still trying to buy stocks. Now, getting back to the net net change, pay that's the first thing you need to always look at. And the crowd that we've had lately in the weekend charts has been a little bit more educated crowd, a little bit more regular, so this is not making as much sense. But if you go in and watch some of the older weekend charts, you'll notice that people will ask about stocks where the net net price change is relatively unchanged for weeks and sometimes even months. And they claim to be a trend follower. Well, if everybody's got to start somewhere. So if you're just getting started, no problem. You know, one guy's like, you always beat me up. It's like, well, come on, you know, <laughs> start picking stocks that are that are moving, you know, that are, that are going in some sort of direction as opposed to sideways. So I, I could never I, I can't ever. Um, how, how do I phrase this? It amazes me how important the net net price change is. So if you're looking at. A stock like this, and I don't know what stock this is, the, the top is cut off, but this came out of um, Trading Full Circle course. You can see it's in a longer term uptrend, but when you look at the moving averages, you can see they're beginning to roll over a little bit in here. Now, as I often say, you want to use your, your indicators, such as a moving average, as an illustrator to help illustrate what's already in the price chart as opposed to an indicator. It doesn't necessarily indicate anything, but it helps to illustrate what's already happened. So in this case, yes, this stock's still in a longer term uptrend, but notice that the moving averages have begun to turn down, and that should alert you to the fact that what? Well, the net net price change, as you can see over the past month and a half, has actually began to roll over. The stock is much lower than it was. Yes, that longer term uptrend may still be in place, but it certainly, ha it certainly has lost some momentum and it certainly could be rolling over. So that's the net net price change. And all you need to do for that, and we'll take a look at it, especially when it comes to the Rusty, is draw a line from the current close and go back in time a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, three months, six months. Just see how far you can go back or just put a horizontal line on your chart based on today's close and see where it was, again, days, weeks, and months ago. Now, what sort of action should we be taking? Well, first thing I would encourage you to do is dust off your transitional setups, such as first thrust and bow ties. Now, I'm just going to gloss over them briefly here. Keep in mind that I get more questions on my transitional patterns than all of my other patterns combined. But the two main ones I would encourage you to focus on and learn more about would be the first thrust and the bow tie. Now, for the first thrust, you want a market to first on the short side at least, you want it to make a major, major new high. Pin stopped working again. That's aggravating. And then after that, you want to see a sharp thrust lower. Now, this lo thrust lower is relative to the volatility of the stock. So a, a move lower... Let's say I, I, I'm just pulling a number out the air. Let's say a 10% move lower in a biotech stock might not be that big deal. Might not be that big of a deal. It might just be uh, an overnight move. But a 10% move lower in a bank, and I think I'm going to use an example of Ozark Bank coming up here. That is a, a big deal. So it's based on the volatility of the stock. If you would have been easily stopped out of a longer term trend trade it's potentially a sharp enough thrust lower. And then we're looking for a pullback. Now that pullback could just be a one bar pullback. And usually, without going into a lot of details, usually a higher high and a higher low, but sometimes you just have a higher low. 
And the reason we're just looking for one bar pullback and not a more deeper pullback is because some of your best shorts often occur when it has a very minor pullback and then the stock begins to sell off hard. So you're not getting that reversion to the mean move that I love when trading pullbacks. Let's see if we can kick this thing back in. Now by that, hopefully it'll let me draw. So by reversion to the mean, here we go. What I'm talking about is, let's say you're trading a fairly deep pullback. Well, there's a there's a good chance that you'll get a snapback in the direction of the trend. And sometimes that snapback is enough to get a swing trade out. But when you're trading a, a transitional pattern, we're just looking for a little tiny move higher. I mean, we'll take a deeper pullback, but a lot of times what happens is people are waiting for this stock to come back and it never comes back. And then when it triggers after just a tiny pullback, they're caught off guard. Remember, everything I do has a psychological basis based on the participants in the market. So when it takes out that low of the pullback, is when you look to go short. So here's a case, and this is a, a bank. So this is not, this is only a few points move lower. This is only like a 10% move lower or, or thereabouts. But it's substantial enough to suggest that the stock is in trouble. So it makes an all time high here, and it also makes a double top. Now, as I often preach, I don't trade directly off of classical technical analysis. I don't see a double top. So, oh, but a short, it's a double top. But I will say, hey, I've got a bow tie or I've got a first thrust. And, oh, I also notice it's a double top. So, this could be a major top in the works. So, it sort of dovetails in with the pattern. And I would encourage you to learn classical technical analysis. Read Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee and all the classics. And some more modern classics such as Pring and Murphy. But don't try to incorporate it all into your trading. Just use it as sort of a confirming pieces of the puzzle. Trade off of setups, not classical technical analysis. And don't try to use everything. Just use what makes sense to you, what you can wrap your head around. I can wrap my head around a double tie because I think there's some psychological basis there. People or might be looking to bail out because it's no longer making new highs. People may have gotten in late to the game thinking that the stock's going to continue higher or the market's going to continue higher. They, and they just they can't take it anymore. They throw in the town by when the market reverses, immediately reverses. These Johnny come latelys are caught on the wrong side of the market really quickly. Shorts might rush in. Shorts like to sell at highs because they have a big ego for some reason. So, I mean, there's I could wrap my head around something like a double top. There's some of these other patterns in there, not so much. Like a triangle, eh, not a big fan of something like that. I don't think you could trade off of that. In fact, I wouldn't trade again off of something like a double top even. But if you see a setup within it, then it might be worthwhile. So before I digress too far, I know, too late. You're looking for an all-time high or at least a significant new high, a multi-year high, maybe a 10-year high would be even better. And then you're looking for a sharp thrust lower relative to the volatility of the stock. And then some sort of pullback. Now, if we back up one day in this, or one, one uh, animation, you can see that this was actually set up on this day here. But it did pull back for a couple of more days. So once this happens, it you could treat it a little bit more like a pullback. And you could see that after the pullback, it triggered an entry. And it didn't go straight down, but it did work this way lower over time. So getting back to the bow tie, we're just simply looking for a 10 simple, a 20 exponential, and a 30 exponential to flip over a fairly short period of time now it's not shown in this chart but if you go way back here to this chart it looks like this and then we're just seeing this part here 
after begins to roll back up, so to speak. So these moving averages come together, what I call a fulcrum point, over a very short period of time, ideally over two to three periods, or three to four periods, I should say. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but you want them to look fairly tight. And we'll go back and look at the Russell 2000, but the Russell 2000 had a lot of like sloppy bow ties, and then right now it's making a pretty serious tight bow tie. But ideally, you want this to be fairly tight. That means that the cycles have come together over a short period of time and changed. So notice the 30 is above the 20, is above the 10 over here, goes to the fulcrum point, and those actually flip over to where 10 is greater than 20, greater than 30. And then once again, we're looking for that one bar pullback and looking to get in if and only if the trend resumes. Now, we're willing to get in on a small little one bar down, provided it triggers, of course. Again, because we don't have the luxury of sitting around waiting for that reverse to the mean move because sometimes new trends take off much quicker. If you're in a longer term uptrend, yes, you do want to wait for that sharper, more deeper correction because that will help to guarantee that some people are shaken out. But with a transitional pattern, you're still getting in fairly early. And as I often preach, in getting in early, the longer-term downtrend, in this particular case for a buy, could still be intact. But the trend appears to be turning. And when it appears to be turning, you're still a pioneer. And like the American pioneers, you either get the gold or get the arrows in your back. Now, let's take a look at a weekly signal. I'm a big fan of weekly signals, especially when it comes to the indices. Market indices can be very choppy because they're very efficient. They're thick, a lot of players. You got hedgers, you got jokers, tokers, midnight smokers, you got <laughs> buy and holders, buy and hopers. Uh, all kinds of people that are fighting it out. And it tends to make for a very efficient market. Now, you can see the Russell made an all-time high back here, back in 2015. And this is why I was bearish back then. And then it made a bow tie. Now, notice here, it was the moving averages were sloppy. Okay, and it sort of tried to bow tie here, but they were really sloppy. And then the market went back up. And then you didn't get your true clean bow tie until here, late 2015. So notice it made an all-time high. At all-time high, everybody's happy. What happens when the market begins to sell off after all-time high? Well, again, the Johnny-come-latelys might be inclined to bail out. They're the last in and the first out. And that selling could be get more selling. And again, getting back to the psychology of the market, why do people sell stocks? Well, people sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Junior needs to go to college, okay? I got a 17-year-old, became a senior today. Well, was it uh, nine months from now or whatever it is, three, six, seven months from now? I might have to sell some stocks, you know, whether I want to or not. And when a market begins to top out, they begin to see, participants that is, begin to see juniors' college fund erode. So they might be forced out for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with the overall market other than it begins to go down. So you can see we had a bow tie trigger. And if you go back and watch my YouTubes from late 2015, you can see I was pretty bearish back then. And the bear market didn't pan out. Well, I'm glad it didn't, okay? But it pays to pay attention. And if you take a look at the Russell going back then, my pen quit again, it lost about 18% of its value. Well, that's nothing to sneeze at for an index to lose 18% of its value. The media, for what it's worth, calls a bull market at 20%. So by the media's definition, this was nearly a bear market. And as I 
often preach, taking a page out of Greg Morris's book, you have to treat all signals serious. And as I've written before, you have to treat every signal as if it will be the big one or become the big one. And I've written about that before. It's a big one, Elizabeth. Now, it's not the end of the world, but when I woke up this morning, I wasn't sure exactly what to talk about. But this was in the back of my mind. It's been in the back of my mind for a while here, especially with the debacle du jour and the rusty going sideways. And I thought it'd be important not to predict early and often, but I think I thought it'd be important today to get in front of this. So when we do get signals and if, no, not if, when we are in a bear market, I won't be coming in after the fact. You'll have a bit of a heads up. Now, I'm hoping that the market will continue higher. There's still a lot of positives out there. But what's the old saying? You know, hope in one hand and, you know, what in the other. See which one gets filled first. I'm hoping for the best, but obviously I'm bracing for the worst. And I haven't gone crazy bearish yet. I haven't put on any shorts just yet, even though I've seen quite a few of them. I'm kind of cautiously optimistic. I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. It's uh, right with a W, right? Now, again, as I've been saying throughout, remember, new highs keeps everyone happy and forces and reluctant. This is why I often say new highs can often beget new highs. I have a friend 20% ago or 15% ago, I forget exactly when, went to a cocktail party. And he sold the stocks and now stocks are 20% higher. He's asking me, you know, he told me he sold because he thought it was too high and now the market's 20% higher. And I tried to explain trend following to him and it fell on deaf ears and he immediately said, well, so I should wait for the market to go down so it's a better value and then buy? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> but had the market continued to make new highs, I think he might have stuck with it because he'd have been making more and more money. I hope it just didn't talk out of both sides of my mouth. But most people will remain happy as long as the market is making new highs. And I guess he's, he's a possible example of throwing the towel in at the last moment. If it keeps making new highs without him, he might feel like he's being left behind. Now, keep in mind that this whole thing that's unfolding right now, this questionable action, the Russell banging out some new lows, this could just be the market's one last shakeout before it takes off again. So remember that a market's job is to confuse and confound the most. All right, we're going to hop into the charts here in just one second. If you want to start asking about individual shares, start asking now. It's here after two years of work and change. Finally, the trading full circle course is up and running. And if you want to check that out, you can start watching the videos for free. Go to this link, 2-trade-docs-discussively. All right, what else? I'm still rolling out the learning management system. That's uh, actually completely rolled out on trading full circle, which means that you have to take the course in a logical order. You have to take each topic of the course and pass a quiz before you can move to the next one. And that's been a godsend for me because every time in the past I've produced something, people buy it and then ask me a bunch of questions. Like I'm thinking to myself, either this person is an idiot or didn't watch the course. Well, they're not an idiot. They just didn't watch the course. So this case, I know whether you pass the quiz or not. All right, any questions, daviddavelander.com. And, of course, you can always go to my website. Now, I want to point out a few things in the charts 
before we get into the, the market overall. Craig says comp 6265. One thing I've been talking about ad nauseum is that we need to watch for 6300 in the NASDAQ. Let me fix my chart here. Now, the other thing that I do is whenever the market gets a little iffy, I'll throw in the 50-day moving average. And it's something I don't look at every day. But whenever the market gets questionable, like now potentially, then I think it's important to take a look at that. So let's take a look at that real quick. All right. Well, if we closed where we are now at 62.60, we would obviously be below that 50-day moving average. Now, it's not the end of the world, and it's not a line in the sand, and there really aren't any mechanical things when it comes to markets. At least I haven't found anything in 20, 30 years of doing this. If there was something that worked purely mechanically, then that edge would be taken out of the market really fast. And you can see the NASDAQ has tagged that 50 quite a few times along the way. But it does score as a negative, and it is well-watched. Anything that's well-watched is worth watching. So, again, longer-term uptrend still intact. Nice positive slope still intact in the 50. But obviously now we're below that 50. And what it was I just preaching about? The net-net price change. So now you can go all the way back to June, a month, two months, I should say, two months and change, and you could see that over that period of time, this market is actually negative. So anybody who bought stocks in early June is faced with a loss. They've been losing money for two months. Now, they might have felt pretty good a week or two ago when the market was at brand new highs. But now they're faced with a loss. Now, this might just be one more shakeout before the market takes off. We had a shakeout, obviously, here. We had a shakeout here. And then here comes that hope. But hopefully, this is just another shakeout. Let's take a look at the bow ties in the NASDAQ. You can see bow ties are beginning to turn down. Now, as I often preach, and I learned this from Greg Morris, when price crosses below an exponential moving average, it will immediately turn down, whether it's a 10-day or a 100-day or a 1,000-day, it'll turn down. So that's why these moving averages have turned down because price crossed below. This is a simple moving average. It takes a little bit more time to roll over than an exponential one. But you could say that you could see that it's now rolled over too. And it's just something I've learned empirically that I like a, a short-term moving average to be a simple moving average to give me a true representation of price, and then I like the exponentials to catch up quicker. And by combining these three, I noticed that the, the crossings, the bow tie, can really help you out. Let's take a look at a weekly for S&Gs. On a weekly basis, things obviously look a little bit better. So, so far, so good. Now, remember, we had a weekly signal back here, and I got a kind of bearish on you. Well, the market was fairly ugly for a short period of time. Let's see. Uh, just go on a closing basis, not peak the trough. Yeah, about a 10% drop. And it didn't make new highs for, what, another year and a half or so. So I wasn't completely crazy to be worried back here about that bow tie. And, again, this is a weekly chart. But I wouldn't get too excited just yet because – on a weekly basis, it still looks pretty good in the NASDAQ. Now, let's take a look at the P's real quick. And then I do want to show you some things in the sectors combined with the bottom of yours. Now, today's a pretty ugly day. It just so happens. I was kind of hoping that the market went on to make new highs, and I, I would just say, well, today's speech, file it away. You might need it someday. 
But unfortunately, and obviously, P is getting whacked a little bit in here. And if we do a measurement, we can go back to June on a net-net basis, and now we're below where we were then. And notice that the moving averages have begun to turn down. Now, just yesterday, again, this little thing that I just learned from Greg Morris over the past couple of years, Notice just yesterday, close was above the EMA, and what, did it, what was the EMA? EMA was positive, okay? Now, today, let's say we close down here, EMA is negative. You see how quick that catches up? That's just a cool little trick. So all three moving averages have turned down, including the 10-day simple, and again, not the end of the world. Now, I don't know where the 50 is, but we'll plot it just to see. But like the NASDAQ, let's go back to the NASDAQ just for one second. 6,300, the prior breakout levels, is an inflection point-ish. Because that would mean that its breakout has failed. Now, again, it's not the end of the world. Let's just put the pieces together one day at a time. But it's certainly not a positive. So let's get back to the P's. We could see that they're now back to where they broke out two months ago. And let's just throw in that 50-day moving average for S&Gs. And lo and behold, as I often say, sometimes technical analysis is like the thermos. Keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold. How do it know? Okay, well, let's clean this chart up a little bit, put that 50 back in. Well, where is support for the S&P 500? Well, support's 2450, prior breakout levels. What's also at 2450? The 50-day moving average. There it is right there. Okay. So a lot of times, technicals will come together at the same point. And that's one reason why you don't want to rush out and try to use 100 different technical indicators. Find a few things that make sense to you and use them. Because a lot of times, you'll have a lot of indicators that are all saying the same thing. And I'll see people, I'll see people use inverse indicators on the same chart. It's like, what the hell are you doing? You know, they use one oscillator, then it's there's an inverse oscillator of that. It's like it's very confusing. Anyway. You know, make some make some trades off of that, and then uh, that'll cure you using that kind of stuff. Russell 2000, well below its 50 moving average. One little simple technique. Let's go back to the NASDAQ real quick. That I often preach about is daylight. If your lows are greater than the moving average, like they were from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, you generally want to be long. Okay. And if your highs are below the moving average, you generally want to be short. Like right here, you'd want to be short. Right here, you want to be long. Mostly. And it's amazing how this simple sec technique can keep you out of a lot of trouble and help to keep you on the right side of the market. Take a look at the daylight with a 50-week. Notice you had daylight during this bear market here, and then you had a lot of daylight since 2009, since the market bottomed in 2009, March, I think. So... There are some concerns here. Again, not the end of the world. It could just be a little shakeout like we had back here. So I'm not going totally bearish on you. But I'm going to make darn sure before I buy into the stock, I really, really like it. And I'm going to make darn sure, make darn sure that I honor my stops on existing positions. All right, let's take a look at some sector action, and then we'll hop into your individual questions on individual issues. So keep asking them. So we have, I have a few stacked up. And then we'll get to those questions that are stacking up, too. No problem. All right. In the sectors, what I wanted to show you is if you go to the drugs, let's see if I can find them. There they are. Some of these subsectors within drugs, you can see have been torpedoed. 
So Teva, for instance, Teva's in drug manufacturers other. Okay, so it's sort of a miscellaneous type of drug, I guess. So if we go to drug manufacturers other, you could see that Teva imploded and took down the sector with it, the subsector with it. And let's see what other stocks, let's see what other stocks, easy for me to say, within that sector. Well, you can see within that sector, other stocks are doing what? Mostly headed lower. A few exceptions, but for the most part, most are headed lower. So Teva helped to bring down some of these other issues in the subsector. And in addition to that, if we take a look at drugs overall, we'll see that drugs overall are now in a bit of trouble. And as of today, they're banging out new multi-month lows. And their trip down has been a fairly persistent one. Persistency on the short side is a scary thing. Markets could persist for a long time on the upside, but persistency on the short side, you usually don't see that that often. And it could be a bit of a Chinese water torture, and then all of a sudden the market can implode from that. And that's something that probably is fodder for research. I just I just look at everything, as you know, from an empirical standpoint, but I've seen that happen quite often. So that's a little scary when you see a market go down day after day after day after day after day. That can cause people to rush in and throw in a towel. So that's kind of the domino effect, so to speak, when it comes to debacle du jour's. Now let's take a look at a few other sectors and then we'll hop out to the overall, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll jump to individual issues. Biotech selling off fairly hard in here, down below it's 50. On a relative strength basis, it looks a little bit better than the other ones, but hey, you can't eat relative strength. Health services beginning to roll over in here. Let's take a look at the moving averages, the bow ties. Not quite a bow tie down, but certainly something to pay attention to. And pay attention to these sectors that were just at all time highs like health services, for instance. Defense looking pretty good in here, I guess, thanks to Mr. Mr. Kim Jong-un. Transport's not looking so hot, beginning to drop out of a first thrust slash pullback. I'm sorry, first thrust slash bow tie out of the pullback. And major airs have been leading the sector down here. Semiconductors, now here's your classical technical analysis, bit of a double top here, and beginning to sell off a little bit, certainly losing some momentum. Let's take a look at the bow ties. You can see bow ties are coming together after an all-time high. Not the end of the world there yet, but we need to pay attention. When you drill down within the sectors and look at the subsectors, you can see some, such as the PCBs, have begun to implode. Now, again, if we look at the sub-industry here, we're going to see, I'm sorry, if we look at the stocks within the sub-industry, we're going to see that there's been some debacle de jours here, such as TTMI. So TTMI got torpedoed and CLS got torpedoed and you could argue that a couple of bad stocks can begin to bring down the whole sector and uh, subsector. And once the subsector gets hit, then it could start putting pressure on the overall sector. And once the sector start getting hit, then obviously the overall market. So pretty mixed out there. Let's just take a look at a few more sectors, and then we'll I promise we'll get to the stocks. We've got plenty enough time for that. Metals and mining have been working their way higher as of late. As I've been saying, a nausea. I'm not a huge fan of these trends that develop at mid-levels or transitions, I should say, at, at mid-levels. I would have much preferred if the metals and mining would have come down here and scraped bottom and then formed a transitional pattern like they did here to move higher. But we'll keep an eye on the situation 
and aluminium is banging out new highs, but it's interesting that within aluminium, CENX just got torpedoed. So we'll have to see if this begins to take down the remainder of the sector. Let's take a look at the banks. Banks have lost a little steam after just making brand new highs in here. They could make a first thrust soon. So that's a little bit concerning. Transports. What else have we covered? Uh, some of these subsectors, again, you've got, I think it was, uh, was it Dub Western Digital, WDS? It was some hard drive maker or something that got torpedoed recently. But you can see it's dragging down the whole data storage sector, which is that going to take down the whole hardware sector? Well, that's the hardware sector is probably not going to crash until we get a crash in Apple because Apple's so thick. But again, you get the idea. Stock can take down a subsector, a subsector can take down a sector. And then so on and so forth. It kind of, again, not to beat the dead horse, but can have a domino effect. MDY, bow tie off all time highs. All right, let's uh, keep the stock pick coming. We'll, uh, we'll start talking about that. Yeah, MDY, uh, S&P, mid cap stocks, you now have a bow tie. Now you need a little bit of a bounce. And then obviously you need a trigger, but that would be obviously a short setting up. Good eye on that one, Howard. Um, IPI I like that's on my lander list for today, but I want to see a deeper pullback. Let's see if we're getting it yet. Um, it just didn't pull back enough for me for my taste. But it's definitely on the watch list. And I like the fact that it's a major coming off a of major longer term bottoms. Amazon bow tied from all time highs. Well, let's take a look at that. You know, when you see these four harshmen, uh, did I say harsh? My brother-in-law makes fun of me because I say harsh instead of horse. Harsh. When you see these four harshmen of the apocalypse, I, I don't even know what those are now. Amazon, Netflix. What, what do you think they'd be? What would the um, – what was it? You always heard there was some sort of acronym they made or mnemonic for those. There was a few big stocks. Amazon, Foam or Folks or – I forget what it's called. But yeah, nothing wrong with taking an uh, taking a look at uh, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, all these big cap stocks. You can see we nearly have a bow tie, not quite a bow tie yet, down in Amazon. And just for S and Gs, let's see. Last time it bow tied way back in 2016, it had a fairly substantial sell off. This could have been a pretty good trade back here. And it's a big, thick, inefficient issue, HV of 19. It's not going to move around a whole lot. But coming off of all-time highs like this, it might be worth a shot. Fang stocks, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Couldn't, couldn't save my life, I couldn't think of that. Kind of like when you can't think of the name of a song. Facebook still looks pretty good in here. If anything, it looks like a buy, okay? I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move, but if it did, you know, above this hide here, that's a trend pivot pullback, so that looks pretty good. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. There you go. N F L X Netflix. Netflix had a big gap higher, but now it's beginning to pull back in, and now you had a little gap down here. I wouldn't rush out and trade Netflix, but it's certainly Certainly that bloom has come off the rose there. And then Google. Or Alphabet, as they call it now. Well, again, let's not trade off a classical technical analysis, but we do have a double top in the works. And then we do have what? We have a bow tie down after this is close enough to an all-time high. All-time high, close enough, double top. So, yeah, on a bounce, you could see the mother of all shorts in Amazon, the Fang stocks. Thank you for that. Don and Donald. All right, SJT, possible bow tie. SJT. Okay. Well, this stock is kind of all over the place. And then it's not coming off a of major, major, major lows like we had back here. 
So I wouldn't be as excited about a bow tie in something like this as I would a stock that's coming off of major, major lows, okay? It's kind of in this longer-term sideways range. In a case like this, I'd let this stock get above eight and then maybe look to play it, and you got a little resistance going back. So I would I would scratch that off of a bow tie, on your off your bow tie list. Okay, speaking of debacles, August, September, and October have a historical tendency to be down more often than other months of the year. Okay, well, that's possible. And there might be some truth to that, and it seems like from my observations, you're probably right. The only problem with seasonality is you can't trade off of it. Okay, now some people might argue with me on that, but... The problem with seasonality is you don't have a representative sample that's large enough. So it, it you can't just say I'm going to sell every August because that might not work for three or four years in a row. And statistically, it still could be a valid reason. But if you're going to use it as kind of a little piece of the big puzzle and you have a bow tie down, you're like, hey, you got a bow tie down. I'd, rather, I'd much rather they have a bow tie down, I guess, in August or September or October than I would maybe in January where you tend to have a little bit of a new money coming into the market and you have a seasonality there. I would caution you against trying to trade seasonality. But good observation, Donald, nonetheless. Okay, Carol was talking about the third bow tie in Rusty. Let's take a look at that. Um, this one looks a little bit more serious. See, your one right here was kind of sloppy because the 10 crossed and then the price went back above and then the 20 went up. I wish there was a way to really zoom in. This is where I wish I had Metastock up and running on this one. You could see it really didn't make a bow tie because your fulcrum is from here to here. It just kind of, just all over the place, Okay. Now, this one here, the next one up, was a little bit better, but it doesn't look like you had a, a, a complete crossing, okay? Because notice that it's hard to see, but the red is actually still sort of above the 30. The 20 is still above the 30. But this is a more clean crossing because you've got, let's take a look at the first day of the cross, so what did I say? Three to four days in the fulcrum. So I don't know if you can see this on your screen here, but the 10 is above the 20. I'm sorry. The 10 is below the 20. And the 20 is still above the... I wish these were in better order. Let's see. So no, we don't have a crossing yet. I'm sorry, the 10 is below the 20. I'll get this right, okay? But it's still above the 30. So that's your, fir your first day when you're counting the cross is when one moving average crosses the other. So we begin to count the days in the cross three days ago. Now on this day here, let's see what we have. The 10 is below the 20 and the 10 is below the 30 and the 20 and the 30 are exactly the same but based on today's action if we close down here then we have our bow tie so three days within three days we have our bow, bow tie which is going to give us which gives us i should say a very nice tight fulcrum so hopefully that clears that up for you uh or makes sense carol but i hear you yeah good eye on that observing those prior bow ties all right rick wants to talk about eye Um, I hear you. It's sort of made a cup and handle type of thing. And again, I don't trade off a cup and handle, but if you've got a bow tie coming out of one, uh, too thin. Well, maybe not. No, not too thin. The average volume is okay. It's a little wide and loose and all over the place. I would pass based on that, but I hear you. It looks like kind of a major bottom. I would prefer if it was like way down here, about two bucks a share, and it going and had gone sideways for quite a while. 
I think it would pass based on the wide and loose action. But I hear you. It sort of took off. It's pulled back a little bit. It's sort of a bow tie. But you do have this wide and loose action back here. And you do have quite a bit of resistance to deal with. So I would pass on that one based on those aforementioned reasons. LGIH. Yeah, that looks fantastic. Um, it's a REIT. I'm not a huge fan of REITs. But it has been in a fairly persistent trend. The reason I'm not a huge fan of REITs is because they tend to be lower in volatility. It's not that I won't trade them. I think we might actually have one that we're looking at. Um, it doesn't look. It's okay. Um, I'd like to see a little tiny bit more knockout, but it looks okay. I mean, I really can't argue with that. It's in a nice persistent uptrend. It's accelerated a little bit over the short term, as you can see here. And now we have a knockout move. Tiny gap. I wouldn't get too excited because it's a pretty tiny gap. But, yeah, that's not bad. Maybe if it knocked out to about 43, I'd like it even better. Alcoa. Well, the problem here is with – a stock that is in trend resumption mode versus trend transition mode. In other words, trend resumption, longer term uptrend pullback as opposed to bottoming out, thrust or bow tie or whatever, followed by a pullback. I like to see it up here in clear air. You can see it's just barely gotten past its prior peak in here. Again, that's a double top thing we talked about earlier. So I would pass on that unless it rallied way past this prior peak in here and then pulled back. W rolling over. Uh, so that was it. Wayfair. W used to be Westinghouse, huh? Show my age. Does Westinghouse still exist? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's breaking down below this little basin here. Moving averages turning down. Um, it's got fairly high HV. So it would have I'd like to see a little bit more thrust lower, followed by a pullback. But I hear you, it could be in trouble. Certainly worth putting on your watch list. SGMS, is that what's that scientific games? Well, my problem here is you've got like two days of this massive rally, and that's about it. Now, on the downside, or if you're coming off a major, major lows, it's a little bit different situation where you might look to trade a stock that only has a few couple of updates of uh, big moves. But I would pass just because you only have these couple of days of this big up move, and I hear you. It's pulling back. looks flaggish. Look at a little, little flagpole here. But I would pass just because it's just two big up days. Hey, Dave, what do you think about X? Looks like a possible gap fill. That's going to be a steel stock, right? Um, I don't necessarily trade off of gap fills, but I would be concerned about this gap because a gap causes problems in a market. Uh, a gap is resistance is the way I look at it. So... Uh, I would find some, if you were dead set on a steel and iron, let's see if we could see what else is in steel and iron. I would find something that looks a little bit, that looks a little bit better. That's near new highs. You know, a lot of these steel and irons are the same problem as the Russell 2000. I'm sorry, the Russell 2000. The, the overall sector is what I mean to say. They're kind of like stuck in these mid-level ranges. See, this looks a little bit better. You can see you've got a big thrust higher. It's a foreign stock. Maybe on a deep pullback or a knockout type of move, that might be worth a shot. See, even this one is, is kind of getting its act together and headed higher. That looks kind of interesting. Let's see if we can find you another one. See, this one looks okay. Uh, this, kind of, this bar here is a little funky, but it's trending at least. 
So I would rather have something that's a little bit more solid trend. I mean, like, look at this one, you know. Look at the trend there compared to X, okay? And then you've got all this bad memories here. So avoid stocks with big gaps against you. Avoid stocks with lots of bad memories. Beeson. Beeson I've been looking at quite a bit. It looks okay. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more knockout. It still could set up, and it's worth putting on your momentum list, but I actually wanted to see a little bit more knockout than we had back here. You know, I always question myself, am I becoming – I'm not a perfectionist in life. I, I would uh, – my uh, webcam was actually turned on the other day. I'm like, oh, crap. You know, you see this office. It's, it's trashed. I come in here and work hard. I just don't come in here and clean up. Um, so it's kind of odd that for me to say look for perfection, but when it comes to charts, I sometimes I'm almost guilty of looking for perfection. And as I often say, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. And I do obsess when I'm looking at charts. In a case like this, it's like I, I would have liked to see more of a knockout move. So maybe if it knocks out over the next day or so, but for now, I think it's going to have to make new highs and then set up again. Or take out the lows and reset things and, like I said, set up for the next day or two. But put on your watch list, but it's not set up. LGIH is a home builder. Okay. Well, it's got a, it has them listed as REITs. Well, the home builders were doing pretty good the other day. I was looking at uh, – let me see if we can get the home builder sector up. Well, it was hitting new highs just the other day, beginning to wake up a little bit. But now they're coming in a little bit. Lost some steam, as you can see. A gap, maybe resistance, does that mean it could also be support? Yes, I have a pattern called. The question is, if a gap is resistance, can it also be support? Yes. I have a pattern called explosive, expo what's it called? Explosive gap. I didn't. Explosive gap pivot or something like that. That does that. Or WTW, yeah, now WTW is looking pretty good. Um, it's a bit of a bummer because it gapped out of this really nice pullback that we had because it made a nice persistent move higher. But unfortunately, it really gapped up. It took, kind of got away from us in here. This is one we've been watching for a long time. But, yeah, it looks pretty good. You'd have to wait, obviously, for another uh, setup. WX was Westinghouse. Oh, okay. WB. Well, the problem here is the same problem we talked about earlier with, um, I think it was Alcoa, is that it really didn't clear this prior peak decisively. So I would pass unless it went on to make brand new highs and then pull back and set up again. Uh, I like that one, HIIQ, or used to like it. I like it because it's on my momentum list, and I like it because it's trending, but it's not set up. So I'd have to see some sort of knockout like we saw here. But the reason I didn't go after it here was because it kind of pulled back to this prior little base in here. It just hadn't really showed acceleration. So it could set up in here if it pulled back to maybe 27 because now it's kind of taken off a little bit. So absolutely put that on your watch list. Now the problem we could be up against is these healthcare stocks are now beginning to – lose a little steam in here okay now it's not bad you can see it still was making new highs just a week ago but if you not so much a net net but if you draw a line from the highs in here you can see they've definitely lost a little steam so that would have me a little concerned steve wants to talk about inda and let's see yeah, this is the obviously the India fund, which had been trending nicely. Now, the HV is really low, as you would expect for an ETF. 
I'm not a huge fan of trading ETFs because they have low HV. Maybe when I become an old fart, some, well, not, I'm already an old fart, but maybe uh, maybe someday if I ever quote unquote retire from this business, which I can't imagine myself doing, um, I might do something with ETFs and just kind of set it and forget it with some uh, rudimentary technical analysis. But yeah, it looks like it's in a bit of trouble now. You know, the big question is, what's the history to pull back in a bona fide sell-off? Well, this begins to look like a bona fide sell-off because it's now pulling all the way back to its prior breakout level. And in a case like this, you sometimes get what I call a forced bow tie because the price forces the moving averages to come together in a tight fulcrum. But I would consider that more of a first thrust. I know I'm just getting confused with the um, – we're just talking semantics here, not confusing them, just uh, combining them. But I would be more interested in the first thrust potential here. But again, I'm not going to short it. It's a little too uh, efficient. Okay, Don, let's talk about NVIDIA. Well, again, same issue, okay? You never, it never did get past this prior little peak in here. And, you know, what's the, what's the, the net net thing is not very impressive uh, for a fairly volatile semiconductor stock, especially if you're looking at the high in here. Now, we talked about the net net and closing base is important to watch. And even that, it hasn't gone anywhere in about a month or so. Let's see. Yeah, so that's over a month's worth of tr sideways trading. So definitely pass on that. No. JBHT. No, I mean, what's your pattern here? It's kind of all over the place. You could say, well, it kind of made a transition here. But then that's a mid-level transition, okay? A transition like this back here. I'd be more interested in. And then longer term, what's this stock do? It's all it's all over the place. So I would pass on that one. What do you think about the energies in a moment like the XLE? Um, well, first of all, you want to draw your 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 big blue arrow, and you can see that the energy stocks have been headed lower. Okay. Now Getting back to the trade the transition things, if you're going to trade a transition, trade them off of major, major lows. And I, if you back the chart way out, you could see you probably had a bow tie back here. So that's a place where you might look to get long off of these multi-year lows or all-time lows. Okay. But over the intermediate term, they've been headed lower. And then... I mean, I hear you. They're trying to bottom out. But again, let's come back to this net net thing. And since for the two and a half months, they're still headed lower longer term. So I would pass on that for now. Let them bottom out. What about the rare earths? Okay. Remix. Yeah. This looks pretty good. Uh, you do have some bad memories back here, but that's a fairly long time ago, and you would get a substantial move if you got up to that level. But, yeah, you need a little bit more of a knockout type of move, but certainly that looks decent. Okay. VEDL, look at a monthly chart. All right, a monthly Yeah, okay. It's closing in on all-time highs. I hear you. And it's in a pretty good tr trend on a daily. Maybe on a pullback, okay? Steel and iron doing okay in here. Metals and mining, so-so. Kind of mid-range chopping around or wide and loose mid-range. But that looks okay. I can't argue with that. But on a pullback, obviously. Okay. 
tech. Well, here's another mid-level setup, okay? So you can see how it's in the middle of this longer-term range. It's just kind of wide and loose. So I'd have a hard time getting excited about it. I'd be more excited about it back here coming off of major lows for a transitional pattern. And then I'd, I'd much rather something as a longer-term trend, such as a couple of those ones we just mentioned, as opposed to something that's at mid-levels and it's got all this resistance to get through. So I would pass on that one. Now, this one looks a little bit better in the metals and mining. You do have some bad memories back here. I don't know if y'all could hear that. The guy doesn't like my presentation. I can hear him. A lot of rumblings out there. A uh, bit of a penny stock. Volume is low because based on the price. Multiply the price time, the volume, average volume. It's fairly low. It's fairly thin. But I hear you. At least it's trending. So maybe on a pullback. All right. We're just about out of time. Is selling an early warning of more serious selling? I yes. Is selling an early warning of more serious selling? Well, we don't know yet because we're trend followers, okay? So we don't know yet, but it's certainly not a good day, okay? So far, they ain't over with, right? And one thing that I did not mention today that I often mention ad nauseum is when you are at or near all-time highs, give the market the benefit of the doubt. Well, today we're down with a percent and change. And then just yesterday, we were about a third of a percent, let's just say a half percent max, round numbers, away from all-time highs. And now we're only a percent and a third percent away from all-time highs, at least in the S&P 500. So one big up day would put you almost there, or a really great up day would put you back there. So I gave my little bear speech, but it's more like watch out for the bear. But you know what? Why did, I have a question. Maybe you guys know the answer. There's like a really busy road over here in Louisiana. We do we have black bears, and there's a bear crossing sign. It's like I need to write my congressman. It's like why would they put the bear crossing on one of the busiest roads? They should move that like out into the country or something. I don't know. I don't understand. Anyway. But yeah, selling can always beget more selling. You have to pay attention. Let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. If you begin to get stopped out, then so be it. Well, look, we're out of time. Geez, I appreciate you guys and girls coming. I always have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell. Any audience? Unanswered questions, you try to say daviddavelander.com. Everyone have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And any unanswered questions, again, shoot me an email, and we'll cover them in next week's show, or I'll give you a direct reply if it's a quick reply. Again, uh, have a great weekend, and I'll see you guys again next week. Thank you.